Uh, so thanks again so much to Ryan, Adam, and Ryan and Adam for coming. Uh, Dr. Ryan Bridges holds the professorship in technology-enabled education and is the director of medical education scholarship at the Department of Medicine, Uni Unity Health Toronto, and the University of Toronto. He's also the director of the Applied Education Research Operatives, ARO, not like the chocolate bar, I'm assuming, uh, research group at Unity Health Toronto. His research focuses on how healthcare trainees, professionals, and the teams they form engage with various modes of self-regulated learning in technology-enabled educational settings, like simulation, and in the clinical workplace. He aims to test the claims that current training prepares professionals for their future lifelong learning. He currently supervises many PhD students and medical residents who help shape and challenge his thinking daily. Adam Gavarkov is a research fellow at the Wilson Center and a PhD student at the Institute of Health Policy, Management and Evaluation, University of Toronto. He received a master's degree in population health sciences from Harvard University. His research focuses on how to support learner motivation and effective self-regulation in technology-enabled learning environments. He is also interested in the relationship between ways of conducting statistical analysis and communicating research findings and the uptake of research findings by educators. He plans to defend his PhD in 2023. So thank you both. Thank you, Jason, for the kind introduction. And uh, shall we get started? Or do you yeah, want to wait sure. for a little bit more? Yeah, no, we could six to go. <laughs> Yeah, we're nearly there. Right? <laughs> Recruit the, the, the robot people to, to fill in those extra five spots. Yeah, um, yeah why don't we get started? And I'll, I'll just say thank you for this kind invitation and for adapting the rounds to us. I know there is a, a model that we're not typically following so that both Adam and I can present to you. And we're really very grateful for you making the time for both of us. I think it's a great time to demonstrate the work that we are doing collaboratively and, and that kind of defines us independently as well, especially since Adam's coming up to, to be completing his PhD. So he has lots of data to share with you. What I'm going to talk to you about is a project that's been funded that is underway. Um, and so I don't have hard data to show you just yet. And my motivation for doing that is I hope that you see this as a, a potential pathway for studying uh, how we learn in healthcare using simulation, using other technology-enabled spaces uh, to understand not just how well people learn what we're teaching them, but how well they learn to learn through the educational experiences we offer them. And uh, I also will apologize. I have to step off around 2.15. Sorry, there's a, an uh, appointment that I need to get to, so my apologies for that. But yeah, I will start us off, and uh, there'll be some Q&A after I speak, and then I'll hand it over to Adam. And so I, I titled this Prepared to Learn, uh, and uh, I stole this slide from, from the web. Dear future, I'm ready. They had it as dot, dot, dot. But I asked that as a question. Are we ready to learn in the future? How ready are we? And how can we be assured that we're reaching the goals of lifelong learning that many of us write about, uh, see in professional contexts? Uh, there's lots of rhetoric around how we are lifelong learners. We teach and we learn purposefully to be these engaged lifelong learners. And so I have some questions for you and I welcome you to type out some thoughts in the chat. Uh, firstly, would you say that you learn the way you do because someone taught you to learn that way? How many of you say yes, no, feel free to type your thoughts uh, or just think, about, think it through. I'm going to ask a series of these questions. Has someone explicitly taught you to learn the way that you do? No is the prevailing kind of, I like that. Uh, I, I sit on the fence often. I also think kind of at times, but when I get down to it, no is my answer actually. Okay, mix of responses, but uh, many no's and some depends uh, kind of responses is the prevailing experience. Okay, the next question I have for you. So this is how you've been taught to learn in a particular way. How often have you been assessed on how well you learn? Not on how well you've learned a content area, but on how good a learner or where you might need some adaptation or change. How much have you been assessed on how well you learn?
a few times, Kirat, you and I will have to chat. But a lot of nevers here. Okay, so an uncommon experience for many who are taking the time to type in the chat, and thank you for the engagement. And so then a question I have is, well, how prepared are trainees to learn the healthcare of the future if this is the status quo, where we're typically not explicitly taught to learn in particular ways, nor are we assessed in how effectively we, effective we are as learners? So I think these are open questions for us to, to be querying. And this was the basis for uh, this project that we are putting together, or we have put together that we're now implementing, uh, and really for the basis of much of my research going forward, uh, my program is very focused, as Jason noted, on this idea of how well we're preparing our trainees through the training experiences, training and assessments that we put them through in medicine, in my case, but I think this can be thought of in a lot of professional education contexts. And so fortunately, there, there is literature that gets us thinking about how we might address this challenge or these concerns within our system. Uh, I draw on the literature around preparation for future learning, which I'll refer to as PFL the rest of today. And from Bransford and Schwartz, the originators of this idea, they define it as the ability to learn new information, make effective use of resources, and invent new procedures in order to support learning and problem solving in practice. They're playing on this notion that half of what we learn today will be obsolete. We don't really know what half that will be. And so we really need to learn how to identify when there's a, a, a problem that we can't quite solve with current methods, effectively leverage resources, invent procedures, and that can be who we ask and how we build the team in addition to what we do ourselves to solve that problem. So how prepared are we to do this? From that PFL literature, there is this notion, they draw on uh, the idea of dynamic assessments. So I'll just walk you through this diagram. Uh, the idea that we're comparing two interventions, uh, education A versus education B. Um, and typically the way we do this in, in educational contexts and in research settings is that we'll put them through those interventions and then we'll have an initial assessment, an immediate post-test. We may bring them back a week later and do some kind of retention test or transfer test to solve a new problem. But we often stop there. So we're sequestering our, our assessment. People have learned in a, a particular way. Now can they perform this particular task we've put before them? And we look for differences between those performances or that, that knowledge base that they've demonstrated. The preparation for future learning and dynamic assessment literature gets us to think beyond that. And so we bring people after their initial assessment to a new learning resource. And this will be common to both interventions. So let's say intervention A and B were um, a manipulation was and how we supported their self-regulated learning. We would then give them a new resource, uh, let's say uh, an online module. And we would say, learn the best you can from this module in the next 60 minutes, let's say. And so now both groups have been prepared in different ways, depending on their uh, random assignment to the interventions to draw on the, their strategies to learn from this new resource. And then we assess their performance on the preparation for future learning assessment following that acquisition of new learning or new information from that resource. And so another term that's used around this is called the double transfer design. So they're transferring in their strategies that they acquired from the first experience of uh, intervention A or B to how they engage with the new learning resource and then transfer out what they have learned from that new learning resource to perform on the PFL assessment. And so this form of dynamic assessment gets at this issue of how prepared are people to learn to learn beyond just demonstrating their, not just, but importantly demonstrating their content knowledge or, or skill set, but going beyond that as well. So there is literature out there, fortunately, uh, on which instructional models we might use that do support PFL uh, and, and demonstrate an improvement in the PFL assessment scores. So Loibel and others and many researchers have talked about problem solving followed by instruction. So people solving ch challenge, challenging problems first and then instructed rather than the opposite, which we typically do, which is demonstrate the, the technique or skill through lecture or whatever uh, kind of intervention followed by a problem solving, the, the, the notes at the end of the textbook chapter, uh, or uh, the practice session that happens in a sim session. So this problem solving first approach seems to be fruitful. 
Uh, a similar model is called productive struggle from Kapoor. And then my colleagues here in Toronto uh, in, and with many of their collaborators have demonstrated that integrated instruction also has an influence. And I encourage you all to, to take a look at these. They have been employed in the SIM environment uh, as well as in, in healthcare and the broader educational space. Now, my problem with those papers is that it's still a bit of a black box, what happens in this middle ground of how people actually engage, transfer in, engage with the common learning resource, and then transfer out to perform more effectively or less effectively on the PFL assessment. And I think that black box can be filled, Jason, I hope you're heartened to see this, with self-regulated learning. Uh, and so self-regulation, uh, I think, is what people are doing, right? They're prepared to engage with the task in particular ways. They have strategies that they have, may have developed or honed due to the experience in intervention A or B. And they're utilizing and selecting those strategies, how they set goals, how they plan, how they monitor their, their progress as they acquire information from the new resource to perform on the PFL assessment. And so that's that was my rationale and our team's rationale, I should say, for the grant that we prepared. Uh, and it is a SHRC funded study. We're very fortunate to have that funding. Uh, we called it Prepared to Learn Toward Valid Assessments of Self-Regulated Learning from Classroom to Workplace. And for the sake of brevity today, I'm going to present to you the, the general model of the study design and the layers of studies. We have three studies that are embedded in the design that I'll show you to give you a sense of how we're trying to capitalize on the design, but also what we're trying to learn from that design. And I should thank many of my colleagues who were involved in putting this project together, Stella Ng, Walter Taveras, Kieran McIntyre, Deb Butler, Adam, Emer Finan, and Genoa Zhu. And so we're starting in the simulation environment. We're teaching thoracentesis skills, which is a procedure for removing fluid from around the lungs. And we have a, a, a two-arm study. One arm is what's depicted here, the problem solving first, followed by instruction second condition. The other arm is the flip. So instruction first, followed by problem solving second. The point here is that people we're creating multiple situations, and I'll take you through those situations because we have a very situated view of self-regulated learning. How I self-regulate my learning in a thoracentesis training environment may be very different from how I do so with another skill and uh, how I manage my finances and so on. So we're very uh, situated in our perspective. Within these situations that we're creating, we're very interested in collecting data on the thoughts, behaviors, and artifacts uh, that the trainees leave behind. Briefly, we're going to do think alouds, have people talk through what they're attending to, why they're attending to certain things as they perform the procedure and practice. We're going to have video uh, data, video uh, um, observational data where we're looking at traces of their performance. What do they do? How do they use their time? And finally, we're going to look at the artifacts they leave behind. For example, the notes they take. Uh, and the how elaborated those notes are. We'll look at this across all the situations that we set up. So that once again, this is depicting the SIM-based intervention side of the study. Then we're going to assess them in two ways, and we'll counterbalance this. And these are two approaches to preparation for future learning. Uh, I won't go into the details, but one is a, a, a embedded resource, uh, which is more paper-based. Another is called Learn Then Perform, which is performance-based. The idea is we're comparing how well these different forms of preparation for future learning assessments are sensitive to the hypothesized differences between the two experimental arms. Once again, we can collect data on thoughts, behaviors, and artifacts left behind by the participants. Finally, a subset of the participants are going to come to the workplace. We have a clinic that our colleague Kieran McIntyre has, has offered where he does thoracentesis thor procedures regularly. And the students will first complete one more preparation for future learning assessment. So how applying to a, a new common resource, uh, seeing how effectively they self-regulate their learning from that resource to perform on a PFL assessment. And then they're going to be on the procedural clinic where we'll observe how they engage with the team, how they look up uh, um, problems that are information that they need in terms of solving problems and so on. And so briefly, overall, then, we have a SIM study, 
an assessment uh, focused analysis of the two PFL assessments bridging into a workplace based learning study. So just to highlight, we have a randomized control trial where we're looking at performance differences on the two PFL assessments due, uh, as per the two, arm, uh, two arms of the interventional trial. We have a focus in on how we develop the PFL assessments, and that's our validation study. And then ultimately, we're going to track the way that people go from event to event, tracking their thoughts, behaviors, and artifacts in order to create a self-regulated learning case study of certain profiles of how people approach and engage in this kind of learning. And so our key implications from this that we expect is that we're comparing how to preparation for future learning assessments, how these designs function as outcomes of SIM-based assessment and SIM-based training, I should say, and also as predictors of workplace-based learning. That's unique. People often stay in the SIM center or in the workplace, don't integrate the two. We're advancing theoretical links between PFL assessments, their outcomes, and self-regulated learning concepts. And we're going to mobilize this evidence to inform how educators can actually assess healthcare trainees for their lifelong learning. And so a lot of details there. I hope that this turns from a question into a statement. Dear future, I am ready, and we're preparing people for their future learning, and we're preparing our educational system to assess for and confirm that we are actually impacting the lifelong learning of our trainees. So more to come here, and uh, Adam will certainly give more empirical data on studies that he's done in a moment. But I can pause here for any questions and thoughts that others may have, please. Where's Jason? Uh, great work, Ryan. I look forward to hearing um, more uh, that comes out of this grant and congratulations. Um, I wonder if you could go back to um, a couple of slides um, to showcase your design. Um, so just to, to get a sense, so we have, we have an RCT going on in the sense that I understood from the blue that people are assigned to one of these two conditions. But then um, in the orange, where we're looking at the PFL assessment, is this, are, are there two, there's two different PFL assessments. Do people in both arms of the conditions receive both or just one? Yeah, they're going to receive both in a counterbalanced order. Okay. So half the people from each condition will do one in, in first, followed by the other, and then the opposite to see if there are any kind of order effects. But we really do want to see uh, taking those order effects into account if the different PFL assessments pick up differently on the how prepared people are for their future learning. The point being, coming to the validation study, if one is more effective in terms of the resources we invested to create it, the sensitivity it demonstrates in detecting differences uh, within condition and between conditions, then we can start to articulate a plan for programs to pragmatically implement this kind of assessment into their practice. Great. Um, and I guess it's the in the, the purple part, the workplace um, aspect is also going to be counterbalanced. Yeah. I, and also, again, treated as the, the squiggly line being like situation from situation, expanding the, the realities of SIM, which is we're supposed to be preparing people for practice. Well, mm -hmm. once again, stopping just here at the end of the PFL assessment. Sure, it's a different assessment. We are demonstrating some preparation perhaps through these assessments, but getting into the workplace, I think is uh, the holy grail of simulation in a lot of ways, but also right. I think uh, the uh, testing of the claim that, that we are preparing people for this real environment as well. The holy grail indeed. Um, toward that end, I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit. I know I've asked you a few questions um, on what you mean exactly by the embedded resource in the workplace based. Um, what's going on there? Um, if you don't mind unpacking yeah. that a little bit. No, my pleasure. Um, so the embedded resource in general, uh, the way we're creating it is we have cases uh, and we will embed two cases that have they're semi-completed uh, basically. And they, these will be cases in the workplace around the resources, systems, and structures that uh, people should be prepared to encounter when they are performing thoracentesis. So for example, uh, let's say you have learners on your team uh, and the learners are asking questions, potentially interrupting the procedure. How do you work with that particular situation in order to teach while also safely performing the procedure with your, with your client or patient? Um, so we'll have a series of cases where 
the references, they'll, they'll again, partially complete. They'll complete those cases through a compare and contrast exercise. And then there'll be a series of additional cases requiring them to solve a problem. It'll be a new challenge about resources, teams, and systems, and uh, think through and provide answers as to what they would do and why they would do it in a particular way. So it's a written case uh, utilizing these embedded resources of the reference case. So the question is, how effectively do they use the reference case? And then how effectively do they perform in responding to the problems and challenges in the remaining cases? Uh, thank you. Um, and so is what makes that, that part workplace based, is it that it's really um, specialized to be, again, like the workplace? Because it's something that, we, that people could do, for example, at home or even you know, after a sim lab, um, which is kind of um, interesting, I guess. Um, but the, the clinic is really clear for me in terms of why it's there. Um, and I think yeah. that's wonderful and very holy graily. And, and good point. So it's true. This could be done. I think we're embedding it there, uh, number one, because I think the participants would like uh, some experience in the workplace and, and that's what we're offering them as an incentive. But you're right. This kind of assessment uh, in doing the validation analysis of the assessments could be something that we do offline, at home, asynchronously. Uh, so yes, the dimensions of practice that are being focused upon, this idea of resources, teams, and systems, are what make it very workplace oriented, but where it is done is an open question for the future. We're just embedding it there purposefully to uh, create that uh, pra practical experience for our trainees. Great, thanks Ryan. Thank you, Jason. Yeah, Bilal, please. Hi, hello. Uh, my question is about the population that you are studying. Uh, are there medical students, medical residents? Or... Thank you. I failed to mention that. Thank you for clarifying. I, so we are focusing on medical students uh, because there are plenty of them, mostly. Mm -hmm. uh, so for the purposes of this design, we do need upward of 70 participants, perhaps more, uh, to, to adequately power the study. And consequently, that's why we went to the medical student pool. But ultimately, many clinicians who I present this to say, oh, it should be residents. Uh, and, and we will target, and residents are our, pri our primary focus in the longer term, but in the short term to facilitate this kind of research, we often uh, shift our focus to medical students. Okay, so uh, the medical students during the simulation, they will be trained to perform the procedure or to think about a case study where there is like the pathology is there? Because it will depend actually for the workplace if uh, if the application would be the observation and the, however the training is going to be like hand, hands-on training on a simulation lab uh, just to see the continuity between the uh, simulation part and the clinical part. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. So yes, in the sim environment, the plan is for it to be hands-on training with a focus on uh, the, the indications and contraindications underlying a typical thoracentesis. So why you decide to do it, how you, how you then do it when all variables are the least challenging that they can be. And then we start to make challenge. So these PFL assessments, you know, there's only so much time. So thank you for asking these questions. I can elaborate now. The PFL assessments are looking at variations in performance that go beyond the typical. Uh, for example, the equipment stops working. The procedure is questionable as to whether you should perform it at all. Uh, is there a fluid pocket? Why would you make a decision to do so or not? And so on. And then we go from these very procedure-oriented uh, variations to system-oriented va variations in the workplace-based module. Great question. Thank you. Any others for now? I, I, I will likely be around when Adam's getting asked questions as well, so can uh, respond to those also. Uh, actually, one last one, and, and thank you, Ryan, for agreeing to, uh, to present. It was a wonderful presentation. My pleasure. Um, I was just question. so the, for the medical students, like in, um, when you're doing the clinical-based procedures, are you gonna be, is it gonna be based on um, different procedures? Will the medical students be doing different procedures or, or are you gonna be computer? And that will be your comparison in terms of the learning criteria, or will it be uh, the same procedure for, uh, for these students? Yeah, great question. So we did, we chose thoracentesis specifically uh, because it is kind of in the medium space of difficulty, according to many of our colleagues. Mm -hmm. uh, that's expert clinicians and also residents and medical students who we've piloted that with. And so we will have one straightforward procedure 
uh, not straightforward, but one procedure that carries through all of this in order to be coherent in our analysis and thoughts on, um, for example, you know, we it's it's not it's purposeful that we have all of these boxes repeating themselves. Do the behaviors here and how they interact with the procedure inf influence and appear to connect to the behaviors here and so on? So having a very specific procedure or content domain you're working with is our rationale for why we can draw these connections through this case study uh, approach, for example. But really true for even the uh, validation and uh, the trial, having your construct clear, in this case, conceptual procedural knowledge underlying expertise and thoracentesis. Perfect, yeah, thanks. Thank you. And just seeing uh, one in the chat here, I'll, I can quickly address. So you mentioned self-learning, however, will this touch self-evaluation? Uh, and that is an important question. So we will be analyzing through the Think Aloud data, the behaviors that people engage in and the artifacts they leave behind in terms of their notes and so on. We will be analyzing for cognitive, metacognitive strategies, as well as goal setting. Uh, and so this is a lens taken from the self-regulated learning literature. Adam can, will speak more to this for sure. Uh, but we use this to influence how we code those data. And one part of that absolutely would be what we call self-monitoring. So how are people monitoring their performance? Uh, what standards are they utilizing to, to engage in that kind of monitoring? And does it result in any kind of adaptation in their behavior or their learning approach, for example? Uh, so these are certainly uh, co core processes of self-regulation that we will be coding for uh, within these different experiences. Thank you. Okay, I think it's time for me to be quiet if that's okay for others and, and uh, hand it over to Adam for uh, data and presentation on his empirical work and a model underlying his work as well. I'll just stop my share. All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone, is my presentation showing? Perfect, all right, well, yeah, thanks everyone. Uh, just to echo Ryan for the opportunity to pre present some of our, our work to you today. I'm going to uh, shift gears a little bit, but retain um, a core focus on, on self-regulation that obviously um, has grown out of uh, Ryan and my uh, collaborations. So my talk is called uh, Setting the Pace for Learners, a Theory-Informed Approach for Supporting Learners' Motivation, Self-Regulation, and Achievement in Online Learning Environments. And this talk represents um, or covers a, a portion of my PhD work, um, which as, as Jason mentioned, um, I'm expecting to complete and defend in the, the summer of, of next year. So to begin, um, online instruction is uh, playing an increasingly important role in the delivery of health professions education to first year students all the way to seasoned health professionals. Um, it allows learners to interact with educational content, educators themselves, peers, and even patients when such interactions would be um, impossible, infeasible, or just too costly to mediate through other types of instruction like face-to-face. -face. And there are a number of um, factors that are driving the increased adoption of online instruction in health professions education, including the need to educate more health professionals, the need to disseminate new innovations continuously to current health professionals, geographically distributed learners, both in training and in practice, uh, learners' busy schedules, limited educator and class time, and increasingly a, a curricular emphasis on fostering self-directed or, or self-regulated learning. Now, of course, uh, the pandemic greatly accelerated our um, adoption of online instruction, right? For, for a long period of time, it really was the only game in town. Um, but due to uh, the persistence of these underlying driving factors, online instruction will certainly continue to play a, a prominent role in the delivery of health professions education um, for, for many years to come. Now in online learning environments, learners are afforded a great deal of control regarding when, where, how, and for how long to engage with instruction. Suboptimal decisions along these dimensions, right? The when, the where, the how, and for how long can yield suboptimal learning outcomes. So learners must be able to self-regulate their learning effectively if they're to take advantage of the autonomy afforded to them in such environments. 
as many of you are, are likely aware, um, self-regulated learning broadly uh, can be considered a, a strategic process whereby learners set goals for what they want to learn, use learning strategies, monitor their progress, and then update their strategy use as needed to, to ultimately attain their goals. And we know that effective self-regulation is, is associated with better achievement outcomes in online learning environments. That said, coordinating and sustaining such an effortful process um, requires uh, that self-regulated -re learning places heavy demands on a learner's motivation to learn. Motivation is the, uh, is the force that energizes and sustains learners' goal-directed actions. Right? If we consider learning as a process from driving a car from point A, which is where uh, what a learner currently knows or is able to do, to point B, which is what a learner wants to know or is able to do. Uh, motivation is the engine that propels the car forward, right? It moves a learner towards their goals. And a number of different studies in, in health professions education have shown that learners with better motivation tend to report deeper engagement uh, in instructional activities and report better achievement, underscoring that learners' motivation is key to their success, particularly in online learning environments, because it's driving that process of, of necessary self-regulation. Now, even among learners in, in the health professions, learners may not always be motivated to learn, depending on what they're learning, with whom, and under what circumstances. Accordingly, learners may sit down in front of their computer to complete an e-learning module or watch a video, only to find themselves unmotivated to do so, right? And I'm sure we can all um, sympathize with that, with that feeling. Fortunately, however, a learner's motivation in that moment is not beyond the reach of an educator's influence, even though the educator is not there in the room with the learner. Educators, via the design of instruction, can help enhance and sustain learners' motivation when learners come into an instructional environment with suboptimal motivation. That being said, um, and I'm sure we can, we can all appreciate this, um, the adoption of online learning technologies has long outpaced evidence regarding how best to use them. Accordingly, we only have a limited understanding of how best to design online instruction to support learner motivation and self-regulation. Self and when educators lack evidence-based guidance, they may be at best designing instruction that only suboptimally supports learner motivation and self-regulation, and at worst actually demotivates otherwise motivated learners. Again, I'm sure you can all um, tell me about you know, e-learning modules or videos that just absolutely killed any motivation that you came into that, that training with. Now, online instruction is, it's often time consuming and, and quite expensive to design and develop. So this risks both resource efficiencies and learning outcomes. Therefore, uh, we propose that a key area of future research in health professions education is in understanding the links between instructional design, motivation, self-regulation, and achievement. And we think this research can then inform faculty development efforts to ensure that educators have the tools to develop motivating and ultimately effective online instruction in a cost-effective manner. Now, we propose that research and faculty development in this area can greatly be facilitated by what are called models of motivational design. Models of motivational design propose the conditions that are required for learners to become and remain motivated to engage with instruction and also function as organized repositories of design strategies intended to facilitate these conditions. So as an example, um, the most common, uh, common model of motivational design is Keller's ARCS model, the ARCS model, which states that for learners to become and remain motivated to engage with instruction, instruction must be designed to trigger their attention, highlight the relevance of the material, support their confidence, and ensure they're satisfied with the consequences of engaging with instruction. The ARCS model also integrates a number of different strategies aimed at supporting each of these conditions, right? Triggering their attention, learner's attention, enhancing relevance, things like that. So as a whole, the ARCS model orients researchers and educators to instructional designs that target particular motivational constructs. In the case of the ARCS model, attention, relevance, confidence, and satisfaction. 
And when, uh, when faculty development efforts are underpinned or guided by models of motivational design, rather than just lists of strategies that educators should apply, educators can develop knowledge regarding what strategies they can apply, but more importantly, why these strategies ought to work based on an underlying theoretical perspective of motivation. And we propose that when learners or when educators develop an integrated body of what knowledge and why knowledge, they're better positioned to design motivating effective instruction in the messy real world context of education. Accordingly, um, we believe that an important goal of research in health professions education in the future should be to advance models of motivational design towards disseminating these module uh, these models to educators via faculty development. Now, the ARCS model of motivational design is by far the most commonly researched and applied um, model in education more broadly and in health professions education in particular. Perhaps you've um, come across it before in, in your reading. However, we believe that the ARCS model is somewhat limited by the fact that its underlying theoretical structure doesn't account for important advances in motivational theory that have occurred since its development all the way back in, in the 1980s. Furthermore, the ARCS model is um, it's really designed to be widely applicable across educational contexts from elementary school education to high school education into tertiary education. And so as a result, some of its components are just less relevant for learners in the health professions. And so we believe that it's probably going to be, would be less efficiently applied by our educators. Accordingly, one of the goals of my PhD has been to develop a novel model of motivational design that is tailored to professional learners that can be used as the basis for future research and eventually faculty development regarding the design of motivating effective online learning. So our model, which we've developed, uh, we have a paper um, that's uh, under submission, under review uh, at the moment. Um, our model is called the, the PACE model of motivational design. And the PACE model is based on a, a synthesis of a prominent theory of self-regulation, Carver and Shear's control theory, <clears throat> and a prominent theory of motivation, DC and Ryan's self-determination theory. And so I'll first briefly describe these two theories before presenting the, the components of the, the PACE model and their theoretical basis. So first, according to control theory, a learner's engagement in an instructional activity, be it completing an e-learning module, watching a video, engaging with a simulator, um, is guided by a, an internal feedback loop pictured here. So to begin the feedback loop, a learner sets a goal for what they want to accomplish during the activity. We can call that an activity specific goal, for instance, to deeply understand the presented concepts and skills. Then a learner specifies a planned course of action that they think will reduce the gap between what they currently know or are able to do, which is their current state, and what they want to know or be able to do, which is their goal state. For example, a learner sitting down to complete an e-learning module might pull out their notebook and plan to summarize what they think are the most important points on each slide as they're clicking through the module, right? That's part of their, their course of action. As a learner implements their course of action, they steadily make progress towards their goal. For instance, they steadily develop a deeper understanding of, of the presented concepts and skills. A learner can monitor their progress by comparing their goal state against input information that reflects their current state, such as whether they're getting self-assessment questions right or wrong, right? That gives them a sense of, okay, am I on track? Am I getting this or, or am I not? Following monitoring, a learner's subsequent course of action really depends on their perceived rate of progress, right? If a learner feels like they're making progress at the expected rate, they're likely to continue with their planned course of action. Right? Everything's going as planned. I feel like I'm getting things as I'm taking notes in, in my, my preferred way, so why change? But if a learner feels like they're making uh, progress at a rate that's slower than expected, they may adjust their course of action in response. For example, by switching up the way that they're taking notes or by going back and, and reviewing previously viewed slides. This feedback loop 
continues to go on as learners engage in instruction, right? Learners implement their course of action and, and monitor the consequences of those actions until they can no longer detect a discrepancy or a gap between their current state and their goal state. When that happens, they'll consider their goal achieved and disengage from instruction, right? They've accomplished what they want to accomplish and, and they're finished. Control theory really emphasizes the importance of a learner's goals in influencing how they engage with instruction and as a consequence, their learning outcomes, right? You can see from this figure that the activity specific goal of deeply understanding the presented concepts and skill informs the rest of the loop, right? It informs the actions a learners choose to make, it inform and it informs what learners choose to monitor um, to assess their progress. Okay, so that's that's control theory. And though a learner's goals have an important directive influence on their uh, engagement, a learner also has to be motivated in order to tr uh, translate their goals into an effective course of action, monitor the consequences of their action, and update their actions as necessary. Uh, according to self-determination theory, learners can possess different types or qualities of motivation, depending on the underlying reasons they have for wanting to attain their goals. Autonomous motivation refers to when a learner sees goal attainment um, as highly meaningful, meaningful, or finds the process of goal pursuit to be highly interesting. Right, And when goal pursuit is seen as, as meaningful or interesting, people feel like they want to attain their goals. Right? The drive to attain their goals is, is emanating from within. By contrast, controlled motivation refers to when a learner sees goal attainment as a means of satisfying external requirements like uh, uh, impending assessments or to satisfy internal pressures like feelings of guilt or shame. And when individuals are controlled in their motivation, they feel like they're, they're being forced to attain their goals, right? The, the choice is being imposed upon them rather than emanating from the self. Research in, in health professions education has consistently found that autonomous motivation but not controlled motivation is associated with deeper engagement in instructional activities and a better achievement. And so self-determination theorists generally consider autonomous motivation to be a more desirable form of motivation, whereas controlled motivation is more undesirable. Okay, so taken together, uh, control theory and self-determination theory <clears throat> predict that when learners set goals emphasizing deep understanding and are autonomously motivated to attain their goals, they'll be more likely to use learning strategies that help them construct a deep understanding of concepts and skills, make regular self-assessments of their progress to make sure they don't go off on don't go off track, monitor their progress in terms of how deeply they understand concepts and skills adapt their approach to learning if their progress is slower than expected and persist in the face of, of difficulties or distractions. And as we discussed, these represent keys for effective learning in general and online learning in particular, right? Because of the importance of, of self-regulated learning in online learning environments. And so as a result, the PACE model proposes the conditions under which learners will become and remain autonomously motivated to pursue goals that emphasize deep understanding. Specifically, our PACE model proposes that for learners to become and remain autonomously motivated toward deep understanding, instruction should be designed to um, facilitate four conditions. First, help learners establish a purpose for learning. Second, provide them with adaptability in crafting instruction to better align with their purpose. Third, support their confidence that they can meet their goals for instruction. And fourth, stimulate their engrossment in goal pursuit by provoking feelings of interest, right? And you can see that we spell out pace there. Um, we've, uh, as you can see, we've adopted sort of a, a model very similar to the ARCS model, right? We have our four components. Some of the, our components are, are similar to, to the ARCS model. But again, this model is tailored specifically to uh, professional learners and is based on a different theoretical uh, foundation. Again, a synthesis of, of control theory and, and self-determination theory. So now I'll spend some time um, uh, propose, or presenting each of these conditions and their, and their theoretical basis. So we'll, we'll start with purpose. And this is really when we were developing the model, purpose is really, was really the, the linchpin and where we started. 
So according to self-determination theory, learners imbue a short-term goal, like the goals that learners might have for, for instruction, with more meaning when they see it as a means to attain longer-term goals that are personally important to them. Right, the meaning that is attached to those longer-term, personally uh, personally important goals can be transferred to those shorter-term goals when those shorter-term goals is seen are seen as a means to attain the longer-term goals. And it's reasonable to assume that the more personally important the longer-term goals are to a learner, the more meaning they will ascribe to a connected short-term goal, and the more autonomously motivated they will be to achieve it. Because, as you'll recall. Uh, feelings of meaning are uh, one of the key underpinning feelings of, of autonomous motivation. And so these assumptions um, really suggest that if we're to understand why learners attach particular meanings to instruction and the goals they pursue through ins instruction, we need to understand the longer term goals that learners see themselves making progress towards through instruction. Right. According to Malkin Covington, this is a, a great paper, I, I, uh, I have the reference um, at the end of my presentation, they say, when students enter a classroom, they don't leave their goal systems at the door. Like any other activity, behaviors such as reading textbooks, studying for exams, and writing papers are embedded in the hierarchical goal systems of individuals. Right. So we need to understand those hierarchical goal systems that students are bringing, bringing with them into instructional contexts. Amongst the most personally important goals that HBE learners possess, um, we propose, are those that they strive to achieve through a career in the health professions. And these goals we call their life goals. We know that prospective applicants to medical school and nursing school and social work school, they often want to apply to, to training because they see a career in the health professions as a means to attain the most personally important, meaningful goals that they possess, their goals regarding the kind of person they want to be, the kind of life they want to lead, and the kind of impact they want to have on the world. For example, consider this quote from a study of high school students. Um, and this was a, a study uh, looking at the reasons high school students have for wanting to um, apply to medical school in the future. This student said, I've always wanted to help people. And this is a form of helping people by means of healthcare and curing people or improving quality of life. For this student, a career in medicine represents a means uh, to achieving their personal goal, their life goal of helping others and, and giving back to their community. Um, life goals are derived from one's conception of their ideal self and thus are the most self-defining and personally important goals one possesses. And so our assumption is that if we can uh, help learners see how instructional activities help them make small steps towards attaining their these highly meaningful goals, perhaps some of that meaning can be transferred to instruction itself, and that can enhance their autonomous motivation. In fact, we propose that learners can be supported in making concrete links between instruction and their life goals, as mediated through the skillful professional behaviors that instruction prepares them to enact. Specifically, we're proposing that learners can be supported to make two, two sorts of links. The first link is between instruction and the skillful professional behaviors that instruction prepares them to enact. Now, learners may spontaneously make this link um, without needing any support. For example, it's often very clear to learners that instruction is preparing them to enact a particular skill or apply a particular behavior in practice, right? When you're Learn, uh, practicing a, a procedural skill in a simulator, it's pretty obvious that you're preparing yourself to then apply that skill in practice. However, we suggest that learners may often fail to extend that link to the life goals that they pursue through a career in the health professions. For example, how does applying that skill or implementing that behavior in practice help you to become the kind of person that you want to be? How does it help you to live the life you want to leave? How, how does it help you to have the kind of impact you want to have on the world? When students answer those questions and connect a uh, instructional activity to their life goals, we consider them as having established a purpose for learning. That's what we call consider a, pur a purpose for learning. A purpose is, is a very meaningful form of, of relevance. Just to, to underscore this, this process, this is the, our, my control theory diagram. Again, I've shifted it um, down into the right here. And what we're proposing is that 
learners can potentially make uh, uh, link their activity specific goal to two other goals, right? First, they can link their activity specific goal to a practice goal, right? Learners can potentially see that deeply understanding the present, presented concepts and skills in a module can potentially help prepare them to provide more effective care to patients with type 2 diabetes, for example, right? They can see how engaging in instruction prepares them to engage in that skill. The other link that they can make is they can understand how engaging in that practice behavior serves their the life goals that they pursue through a career in the health professions. For example, they can understand that providing effective care to patients with type 2 diabetes, it helps them to achieve uh, their the goals they pursue through a career in the health profession, such as making a meaningful difference in the lives of others or giving back to their community. Right. So these are the links that we're proposing. Students do not routinely make in instructional context, but we can support them in making through principled instructional design. Particularly, uh, we think that um, one potential way of supporting learners and establishing a purpose for learning is through what we call a, a purpose prompt. And we envision a, a prompt is comprised of two steps. Uh, first, a prompt should encourage learners to consider the professional skills that instruction prepares them to enact. So for example, in an e-learning module on uh, the topic of the physiology of weight loss, um, which we'll, we'll talk about later, um, uh, a message can be embedded that states, by learning about the physiology of weight loss, you will be prepared to counsel patients in realistic, sustainable weight loss attempts to support their long-term health, right? Um, then a prompt could encourage learners to consider how these professional skills serve the life goals they pursue through their career. So for example, they could be posed with the questions, how does this outcome align with the kind of physician you wanna be? What do you want to, or what you want to accomplish through becoming a physician? We propose that a two-step prompt like this could help learners make a concrete link between instruction and their life goals as mediated through the skillful professional behaviors that instruction prepares them to enact. So that's, that's, that's the purpose condition. We'll talk a little bit more about our, our empirical work related to this condition. And we predict that um, when learners establish a purpose for learning, it'll compel them to set an activity specific goal uh, to deeply understand the concepts and skills in, or in order to retain them for a long period of time and then be able to transfer them into practice, right? Because that's how they're actually going to make progress towards um, their life goals. And it will also enhance learners' autonomous motivation to pursue their goal because it imbues instruction with a high degree of, of personal meaning. So that's the purpose condition. Now to the adaptability condition. So one uh, potential that is derived from, from uh, a control theory perspective is, you know, perhaps after establishing a purpose for learning, a learner feels compelled to adapt an instructional activity to better align with their purpose. So for example, consider a medical student completing an e-learning module on um, glucose metabolism. Right? They're supported in, in establishing a purpose for learning, and they come to see that learning about glucose metabolism uh, can help them achieve their goal of their life goal of helping others and making a meaningful difference in their community, because learning about glucose metabolism is necessary to provide effective care to patients with diabetes, type 2 diabetes. Right? But perhaps they think instruction would better prepare them to provide care to patients with type 2 diabetes if in information on glucose metabolism was supplemented with, let's say, um, clinical practice guidelines for type 2 diabetes, or perhaps information on how best to communicate with patients with obesity in a non-biased manner, right? Control theory really does paint learners as these strategic self-regulators that might feel compelled to adapt instruction and what it entails in order to better align with their long-term goals. And so we see this, um, this uh, potential for learners to want to craft instruction as a potential consequence of um, them establishing a purpose for learning. Now, when learners' adaptations are based on their purpose, um, we predict that the adaptations they choose to make may better support their autonomous motivation, right? Because they'll feel like instruction is even better aligned with their, um, their life goals, and that might imbue instruction with even more um, personal meaning. 
The third condition is, is confidence. So according to control theory and, and many other theories of, of achievement motivation, before and during goal pursuit, learners can judge the probability that they will attain their goals. Um, when a learner has established a purpose for learning, if a learner is confident that they'll attain their goals, then we predict that they'll experience high levels of autonomous motivation, right? They've, uh, instruction has been imbued with a high level of meaning. Learners feel confident that they'll succeed at instruction, and that's a really good combination, right? That we would expect that combination to fuel autonomous motivation. However, we uh, believe that if a learner has established a purpose for learning and they're not confident, then they may experience poorer motivation than if they had not established a purpose for learning in the, in the first place. And that's because linking instruction to some of your most uh, fundamental, highly important goals, it really uh, raises the stakes of success for instruction. And if a learner doesn't feel confident that they'll be able to achieve their goals for instruction, they won't be able to learn the material presented to them, then this can be a highly threatening situation. Right? And they may actually experience less autonomous motivation than if um, uh, instruction was attached to lower stakes. And then our final condition is um, what we call engrossment. You can think of it as interest as well. Um, uh, so as we've talked about, uh, according to control theory, learners will choose a course of action that they believe will best reduce the gap between their current state and their goal state. But in addition to helping them make progress towards their goals, learners' actions also have the potential to stimulate feelings of interest, but only to the degree that instruction enables interest-enhancing actions. We know that problems, puzzles, and experiments, especially when they contain unexpected information, can trigger students' interest. Therefore, we predict that when instruction embeds activities like problems, like puzzles, and like experiments, as learners work through that feedback loop and they and, and navigate through instruction, they'll uh, uh, have their feelings of interest stimulated by those activities, okay? Importantly, um, the engrossment component really targets the um, uh, feelings of interest that underlie autonomous motivation, whereas the purpose component really targets feelings of uh, meaning that underlie autonomous motivation. And so by including both of these components, we're really targeting both of those key feelings that together contribute to, um, contribute to autonomous motivation. Okay, so those are, those are our, our PACE conditions. So just to provide a, a summary of, of our predictions, uh, we predict that prompting learners to establish a purpose for learning will encourage them to set goals that emphasize deep understanding and enhance their autonomous motivation, but only to the degree that they are confident that they can attain their activity specific goal or their goal for instruction. An activity embeds interest enhancing elements and they can better adapt what the activity entails to better align it with their purpose. And we believe that a, a key strength of our, our PACE model is that it, um, it culminates in these highly specific testable predictions to um, enhance researchers and uh, educators uh, ability to apply our model, we've packaged these predictions into a um, sort of a statement that looks more similar to the ARCS model, right? And to, to remind you, um, the PACE model states that for learners to become and remain autonomously motivated toward deep understanding, instruction should be designed to help learners establish a purpose for learning, provide them with adaptability and in crafting instruction to better align with their purpose, support their confidence that they can meet their goals, and stimulate their engrossment and goal pursuit by provoking feelings of interest. Now, the PACE model, it's really um, intended to be a theoretical structure that can inform future research and faculty development with regards to designing motivating online instruction. Accordingly, we see um, three key areas of research related to the, the PACE model. First are studies to test PACE model predictions. Right, um, most of our predictions are only supported at this moment by indirect evidence, and none of our predictions are supported by evidence um, generated among learners in the health professions. Right, and so before we disseminate this model to educators, it's important for us to generate more empirical support for the model. 
Second are studies to identify strategies for facilitating each pace condition, right? As you'll recall from, from the ARCS model, uh, models of motivational design uh, integrate strategies for facilitating each of their conditions, right? Whether it's to stimulate learners' interest or support their confidence or, or so forth, right? And so we need more studies to, um, uh, to identify how we can actually support confidence and help learners establish a purpose for learning and, and so forth. Now, importantly, these studies can leverage mediation and moderation analyses to also test key pace model predictions, right? And so we can sort of check off these first two um, boxes um, in, in, in one study. Finally, our, our studies to identify the best ways of building educator capacity to implement the PACE model. But again, we think that this area of research really needs to wait for more um, evidentiary support for, for our model. And so we're really focused on the, the first two um, areas of research at the moment. So that brings me to the last third um, of my, my uh, presentation. We've gone about an hour with, without any data. So I think that's probably about enough time. Um, so I'm now going to uh, present on a, a study that we've conducted to test a design strategy for establishing a, a purpose for learning among uh, medical students. And in so doing, we also sought to test some key uh, predictions derived from, from the PACE model. So our research questions were, were as follows. First, um, do medical students who complete an e-learning module supplemented with a, a purpose prompt um, differ in their autonomous and controlled motivation, self-regulated learning, and knowledge retention compared to students who do not receive a prompt? Um, and second, uh, does the effect of a purpose prompt depend on learners' confidence level? Right, this is a, a randomized control trial. And based on the PACE model, we predicted that uh, learners who received the prompt would uh, report greater autonomous motivation and would demonstrate um, more effective self-regulated learning and, and better knowledge retention, but only when they were confident in their ability to learn the material presented in the module. Among students who weren't confident, we predicted that they would actually report lower uh, uh, autonomous motivation when they received the prompt compared to when they didn't. Our study was conducted among um, 128 first through third year students from five Canadian medical schools. Uh, students were asked to complete an e-learning module on uh, the physiology of, of weight loss. Uh, and students were able to complete this module um, on a personal computer. And as a result, were able to uh, complete the module at a time and place of their convenience, which replicated the uh, circumstances under which students usually complete these sorts of, of modules in, in medical school. The um, purpose prompt uh, was a single slide only included in the intervention version of the module that prompted students to consider how engaging with the module prepared them to practice medicine in a manner consistent with their long-term values, uh, goals, and, and aspirations. And that, that, that slide is it's the top slide on, on uh, your screen. Uh, students were also asked to um, type a reflection to the prompt in a text box that was embedded in the slide. And finally, the prompt included a patient testimonial uh, from a patient representative from Obesity Canada, who we collaborated with on this project. Um, the narrative described that patient's experience working with a primary care physician and the impact of that experience on their long-term health and happiness. The slide was implemented or was um, uh, embedded right towards the beginning of the module after the a general introductory slide that just introduced students to the topic and right before a uh, the learning objective slide. This is a, a just a flow diagram of our study procedure and, and measures um, today for um, we're only going to focus on the, the motivation outcomes um, just because we're still fine tuning our analyses on, on the other outcomes. So students were randomized to receive one of two versions of the module. One version uh, had the uh, prompt slide embedded within it, the other didn't. Uh, then after the learning objective slides, students from both groups completed the self-regulation questionnaire academic as a measure of their autonomous and controlled motivation, and then the perceived competence for learning scale as a measure of their confidence. 
Um, to analyze our, our data, we built um, Bayesian regression models for each outcome, uh, controlling for prior knowledge and initial interest, which we thought might be potential confounders of the moderator outcome relationship. Uh, so Bayesian estimation, unlike frequentist estimation, produces an entire probability distribution for each parameter in a statistical model. So to illustrate um, on this slide, on the, on the left-hand side of the slide here, this is our estimate for the effect of um, prior knowledge on controlled motivation from our, our, our uh, model. And so you'll see that this is this isn't a this estimate isn't a point estimate and a 95% confidence interval, right? Rather, it's a uh, it's a uh, density plot uh, representing the probabilities that the parameter takes on certain values, right? Values near the peak of that distribution represent the most probable values for that parameter based on the data, and values near the tails of that distribution represent less probable values for that parameter based on the data. And I'm happy to um, discuss the, the nuances of, of Bayesian uh, um, inference in the question and answer period if, you, if you're interested. Um, we then used our model to predict uh, the effect of the prompt on autonomous and controlled motivation at different levels of confidence, uh, which uh, uh, in order to investigate that predicted uh, moderation effect. So um, in terms of our, our results, um, I'll first describe the, the responses to that, uh, the prompt responses. So um, surprisingly for us, though perhaps not surprisingly, um, only 69% of uh, participants in the intervention group actually typed a response on the prompt slide. Um, and so suggesting that not all participants in the intervention group actually engaged with the, the prompt on a, on a deep level. Um, that said, there were certainly um, lots of responses. I'll give you a, about a minute to, to read these uh, the two students' responses here. And you'll notice that um, a lot of the language that they're using indicates that they're making the connections that are required to establish a purpose for learning, right? So for at least some students, um, the, the prompt seemed to have its, its intended effect. Okay, so um, we'll move on to our uh, results um, on, on motivation. Now, this is a scary plot. Um, I acknowledge that. And so um, we'll just spend a little bit of time orienting ourselves to, to the plot, and then we'll um, discuss the, what the plot is, is telling us. So um, the x-axis for this plot um, is, uh, are the effect sizes of the prompt, and they range from minus two whereby the prompt had a negative effect on motivation to positive two, whereby the prompt had a positive effect on motivation. You'll see that the, um, the effect estimates are represented as probability distributions, again, because we're using a, a Bayesian analysis. Um, effect size values closer to the peaks of the distribution are the most likely values for the effect size based on the data, right? Those are our best estimates for what the effect size is. Values that are closer to the tails of the distributions are much less probable given the data, right? Based on the data, we don't really think those are, uh, those aren't good estimates for, for the effect size. The blue lines at the bottom of the distributions are what are called density intervals. The light blue bar reflects the uh, interval within which 66% of the most probable parameter values lie within. In other words, we can say that we have with 66% confidence, we can say with 66% confidence that the effect size of the prompt lies within that light blue bar. The medium blue bar reflects the interval within which 89% of the most probable values for the effect size lie within. And the dark blue bar represents the interval within which 95% of the most probable values lie within. 
uh, in Bayesian uh, inference, no, no p-values. I'm not going to be showing any p-values here. Um, and it's typical to show multiple intervals like this, density intervals, just to give you a sense of how confident we can be in our estimates, right? Um, so the top row of this plot, so we have two, two distributions on the top row. The top row reflect our effect size estimates at very low levels of, conf of confidence, defined as two standard deviations below the sample mean on the perceived confidence for learning scale. The second row are the effect size estimates at low levels of confidence, defined as one standard deviation below the mean. The third level are the effect size estimates at high levels of confidence, defined as one standard deviation above the mean. And the bottom row are the effect size estimates at very high levels of confidence, uh, confidence defined as two standard deviations above the mean. If you direct your attention to the autonomous motivation column, you can see that for very low and low levels of confidence, the effect size seems to be negative, right? In other words, the um, students who received the prompt tended to report lower autonomous motivation than students who did not receive the prompt, right? And we, in other words, the prompt was harmful. It didn't help, it hurt. Um, and we can be pretty confident in that interpretation because as you can see, for the, see the, the middle or the medium blue bar, that's the 89% interval, that interval falls completely to the left of zero, right? So we can say that with at least 89% certainty, the effect size at very low and low levels of confidence is negative, it's less than zero. By contrast, at high and very high levels of confidence, the effect of the prompt seems pretty positive, right? In other words, um, students who received the prompt tended to uh, report higher autonomous motivation than those who didn't. And again, we can be um, pretty confident in that conclusion given the location of, of these, um, uh, uh, these intervals, okay? Um, so in other words, our results uh, support our hypothesis that the effect of the prompt was mediated or was moderated rather by, by confidence. Uh, if you direct your attention to controlled motivation, it really seems uh, there, there's not as clear a picture here, right? It doesn't really seem that uh, like the uh, prompt had as much of an effect on, on controlled motivation, um, evidenced by the fact that the 66% um, interval, that light blue bar, um, includes zero at, uh, at every level of, of confidence, right? So there's just not as much evidence to suggest that, um, that this um, that the prompt had any effect on, on controlled motivation. Okay, so that's our, that's our, um, our, our result for, for motivation. Um, so, so in interpreting these results, um, our results provide preliminary support for two key pace conditions, that uh, establishing a purpose for learning can enhance learners' autonomous motivation, but only when they are confident in their ability to achieve their goals for instruction. When they're not confident, it actually is harmful. And this is, uh, uh, this um, I think emphasizes a, a pretty underappreciated point in health professions education, which is that seemingly innocuous design strategies can actually be harmful for some students, right? If I was to like show you the slide that we used in our study and asked you, hey, you know, what do you think the effects of this slide would be? I think it would be reasonable if you said, oh, I think at best it would be a positive and at worst it probably wouldn't have an effect, right? But actually in reality, at worst it was harmful for some students, right? And so that emphasizes first the power that educators have over learners' motivation, both for good and for ill. And it also emphasizes the danger of relying on assumptions about what may or may not be a motivating instructional design, right? We shouldn't be relying on assumptions. We should be generating more empirical evidence to actually uh, um, illuminate what is a, an effective uh, instructional design for whom and under what circumstances. It also emphasizes the importance of conducting randomized trials, comparing different designs, and um, uh, uh, assessing the effective effects of designs across moderating factors, right? If we had um, if we hadn't include included confidence in our 
um, in our analyses, the effect of the prompt would have looked largely null, right? Because the beneficial effect among confident students would have canceled out the, the harmful effect among non-confident students, right? And that uh, interpretation would have, um, would have missed the positive effect that it might have on some students and the negative effect it has among others. So we need to, uh, to analyze the effects of designs across moder moderating factors. And finally, our results suggest that um, we need to consider multiple motivational conditions when designing instruction, right? In particular, um, we know, or from this study, we, we have evidence that helping learners establish a purpose for learning can be an effective strategy, right? It can enhance their autonomous motivation, but we need to also ensure that learners are feeling confident in their ability to succeed at instruction, right? So we need to attend to multiple motivational conditions when we're designing instruction. And that's a key tenet of, of the PACE model. So to wrap up, um, we think that a, a, a really important area of future research um, is to investigate the effects of combining strategies targeting different components of, of the PACE model, right? For example, factorial uh, experiments that compare the um, unique and combined effects of a purpose prompt uh, with a uh, strategy for enhancing confidence or enhancing interest, for example. And again, we were surprised to find that um, only 69% of, of intervention group students responded to the um, or typed a response um, on the on the prompt slide. And so we think that uh, the, the um, uh, intervention might actually have a, a stronger effect if more students were engaging more deeply with the messages um, that were communicated on that prompt. And so future research can look at that as well. But in general, um, I think we, we consider this study to be a good first step um, in providing result or providing evidence for, for the PACE model and ultimately uh, being able to uh, deliver faculty development to educators, providing them with the tools to design more uh, motivating and effective online instruction. So I'll, I'll leave it there and I'll um, uh, take any questions you have at this point. Uh, please, Jason. Thanks for a great talk, Adam. I really enjoyed hearing about it. Um, so one question um, I had, particularly going back to actually, I, I know we've, we've spent a lot of time talking about theory, um, but that was such an important part of, of the work that you and Ryan are doing. Um, you know, and one of the outcomes, you know, or, or aspects you, your, uh, your empirical work had demonstrated was the importance of considering you know, multiple, you know, uh, motivational perspectives. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the the rationale for focusing on self-determination theory and control theory. Um, there's lots of motivation theories, as I'm sure you're aware of. Um, and, you know, with, there's, a, there's, there's some overlap, but there's also distinctions. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about um, how you chose those two and, for example, not, you know, attribution theory, goal orientation theory, expectancy value theory, et cetera. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so we started with um, we started with self determination theory, um, and uh, I think a, a pragmatic reason why we did so is because uh, Rashmi Kusakar is on my committee, um, who's a, a well known researcher in, in health professions education and, and specializes in, in um, self determination theory. But we decided that that was a um, a defensible theory to adopt in the field of health professions education because it's enjoyed such empirical support in the field. Um, there are a number of studies that have looked at um, the antecedents and consequences of both autonomous and controlled motivation among learners in the health professions, including but not limited to medical students. And so we felt like that was a, a theory of motivation that had particularly strong empirical support um, in the field. Uh, we then adopted uh, control theory because we felt it was important to, um, to uh, combine two theories that, are, um, that were compatible in their meta-theoretical basis, right? Self-determination theory has a lot to say about um, human agency and, and the bases for, for motivation. And so we wanted to ensure that we were, um, we were uh, aligning self-determination theory with a uh, perspective on self-regulation that was consistent with self-determination theory's meta-theoretical meta basis, and uh, control theory provided that. I think you, you can, um, or it's my perspective that control theory provides um, 
it's not overly specific, right? It provides a pretty um, loose skeleton of what self-regulation might look like that is expanded upon by other theories of, of self-regulation, right? So Winnie's model, for instance, um, a lot of that can be seen as building off of, of control theory. So we, we thought it was a good sort of skeleton of self-regulation to build off of in, in future work. Thanks, Adam. So uh, thank you, Adam, for such a wonderful presentation. And uh, as it, it's not my field, so as you are uh, giving the presentation, I was trying to digest the information. And in my mind, I was thinking, uh, okay, motivation and learning are being looked at uh, together. So in my brain, I was, uh, you know, there's the assumption then that the presence of motivation guarantees that the uh, learning will, will occur. Is that how it is being? Uh, is that the assumption that if you have motivation, then that learning will occur? But I like the the uh, the nuances and the summary you gave at at the end, and uh, that you know uh, different things to consider, and it's not as simple as that. Any yeah, comments? Yeah, sure. That's a great question. So uh, my assumption is not that if motivation is there, uh, learning will will follow. Um, and a part of that, um, the, the lack of that assumption comes from, in our case, control theory. We think that, um, just to go back to this slide, we think that when learners are motivated to pursue um, particular goals, they're motivationally primed to engage in all of these processes. Right? They have the energy that's required to do all of these things, but that doesn't guarantee that these things will occur. Right, Theories of, of self-regulation um, also indicate that learners must have like knowledge re re uh, regarding what strategies are effective or ineffective. Right, So for example, learners might be really motivated, but they might default to their usual study strategies, and their usual study strategies might not actually be that effective. Right. So they're, you know, they're spinning their wheels, right? To use the, the engine metaphor, they're they're spinning their wheels, they're revving their tires, but they might not be going anywhere, or they might be, you know, going the wrong place if they're using the wrong strategies. And so certainly we think motivation is is I think of motivation as a sufficient, uh, as a necessary but not sufficient condition for learning to occur. Right. And but and, but it's important to emphasize because I think the opposite is sometimes assumed in health professions education, right? I think people assume that, oh, you know, these are medical students. These are, these are nursing students. They've, they've killed themselves to, to get into to, to medical school, right? They must be highly motivated, right? So people discount motivation from the, you know, the ingredients that contribute to learning often. And right. so we really want to emphasize that, no, there are, there are situations where learners may not be optimally motivated, or they may be more controlled in their motivation than, than autonomous. And so it needs to be attended to. Right. So, so the other thing is, um, um, at, at the beginning, when you are talking about the AX uh, model, mm -hmm. and I was thinking, okay, can you apply, uh, if you have learners of different levels of motivation, you have a group and uh, their le levels of motivation is, is not homogeneous. And um, so, and, and I think you addressed that point later with your, uh, with your trials. Um, I was thinking, how can you apply, let's say the HAC model or any of the other models uh, to, to such a group that is, you know, heterogeneous in their levels of motivation? Yeah, so there's, uh, I think, two accepted or two approaches that one could take. One is um, assume that everyone is uh, homogeneous and provide everyone with the same sort of instructional design, right? And so for some people who are already motivated, maybe it won't have an effect. For other people who are unmotivated, it'll have a, a stronger effect. Uh, maybe for motivated students, like have, have, having to uh, develop a, a purpose for learning, they might think, oh, forget it. Like I'm already motivated, like this is annoying, right? Um, the other, perspective is we can adapt instruction to the learner's incoming motivation levels. And there's lots of work that's been done on adaptive instruction 
outside of um, health professions education um, as it relates to, to adapting to learners' motivation and emotion. Um, less work has been done in the field on that, and that's uh, certainly something that we can explore in the future empirically. Thank you. Uh, Bilal, do you have a, a question as well? Uh, thank you for uh, the presentation. It's uh, very interesting. Actually, my question was concerning the study that you conducted. Uh, so, uh, so uh, because in medical school, uh, mainly the, 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 there is a very competitive uh, uh, like ambience there. How, how did you measure uh, uh, what tool did you use to differentiate between the autonomous motivation and the controlled motivation? And the same question was concerning the confidence level. What tool do you use to assess the confidence level of uh, the students? Thank sure. Um, so for autonomous and controlled motivation, we used the um, self-regulation questionnaire, which is um, has received um, validity evidence uh, both outside and inside of, of health professions education. And it basically asks uh, students to... Um, uh, endorse different reasons for why they're engaging in an activity, right? So it says, I'm engaging in this acti activity because I enjoy it, or be because I think it's personally meaningful, or because I feel like I have to, or because if I don't, I'd feel guilty, right? And based on the, the level of endorsement given to those different reasons, um, you can calculate a um, autonomous and controlled motivation score uh, for those individuals. And then for, uh, for confidence, we use the perceived competence for learning scale, um, another self-determination theory-based scale. It's, um, it, its language is very similar to a self-efficacy scale. Uh, I would imagine it would be empirically very similar to if we used a self-efficacy scale. So we're essentially measuring learners' self-efficacy um, that they can uh, meet their goals for instruction. And again, has received um, validity evidence um, in, in the field and showed um, good uh, properties in our study as well. Thank you. I think perhaps we're we're running close to time. Um, what I'll do is I'll um, just show uh, put up my my email here. Please uh, don't hesitate to um, to email me if if you have any additional questions. Happy to discuss any elements of of the work further, and really appreciate the opportunity uh, to present our work to you today on behalf of myself and and Ryan. Thanks again, Adam. Great work. Looking forward to hearing more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adam. It was wonderful. Thank you, Adam.